bring everything but the hog out. Think we eat nothing but grass, what you talking about? I'm about to jump into the whip and hit the whole foods early. Get everything to get that soul food working. Like mac and cheese, the collard greens, the black eyed peas, and get a roast of that tofu turkey. Got cornbread, even got stuff. Mashed potatoes so good, put your hand in it. Stream beans, and you know we got yams with it. Got cap Hi guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're actually at John Scott's Meats here in Paisley. Earthling Ed is actually up with his surge team, so we're doing a vigil with the Save Movement Scotland here as always. Like I say, whether we see any comings and goings to the slaughterhouse, I do not know because it's been known quite often that when they know that these vigils are made public and there's a celebrity, as, as they say, coming to the vigils, they obviously start to change the delivery times of the animals coming to slaughter, so... Whether we can bear witness, I don't know. It should be a great, great day. Let us see. Earthling Ed is one of the most inspirational speakers out there. He does so, so much for the animals. Let us see. Everybody would want to do even a bit of what he does. Let us see. We all do so, so much, and we've got to be active for the animals. We owe it to them. Let us see. You can't just be vegan and living a, a vegan lifestyle because at the end of the day that's just not enough. We need to keep speaking up for the animals, we need to be active, we need to be out there. You don't need to be out obviously at a slaughterhouse to be a vegan activist, there's so so many things that you can do. Just sharing your lifestyle, speaking to your family and friends, spreading the message every single way you can in every conversation that you can possibly do. Like I say, that's planting seeds, that, that is as much vegan activism as anything because that's the only way we change perceptions is be speaking to the public doing outreach and such likes because it's supply and demand this only exists because people actually want this stuff so they want pig flesh they want cow flesh they want you know in sheep flesh it's disgusting but that's the world that we live in and some days it's just just really really hard waking up in the morning realizing the world that you're in and this is the kind of thing that a lot of people when they just go vegan they, they they tend to withdraw into themselves because they suffer so so much because they realize that they've been lied to all their life it's this dystopia you know what i mean waking up in a dystopian world and that's very very true like i say sometimes we just we've just got to really be kind to ourselves because we think that the world's no moving quick enough that we're not doing enough that the animals are still being harmed every single day and yeah they are that's 70 to 100 billion a year and it's disgusting but we're growing, we're growing, we, we are growing, and like I say, you've got to, I believe that we will see a vegan world, like I say, you've got to believe that, because if you don't, what, what would you do, you know what I mean? So anyway, we'll show you what we can today, guys, I hope to get some footage, and obviously Ed's workshop tonight as well, speak to you all. I like it. So, why are we 
Shibboleth on through. Moose down the front off of the back card isn't going to change so, his mind. What, why explain the you. process? I explained it there. Mate. Are we breaking the law or are we doing this? In your you're, you're blocking a public highway. Are we breaking the law? Yeah, are we breaking the law? You're causing obstruction. Right. Right. If you just slow walking them in and you're approaching them, trying to go for them, that's tantamount to harassment. No, right. Absolutely not. Oh, no. Right, listen. <laughs> if somebody's walking down and, and they don't want to speak to you, you keep them up to their window and approaching them, yeah. wanting to speak to them, and they don't want to speak to you. We're on the stage. We have someone, one person approaches them okay. once okay. in order to speak. ask them I can if we could proceed. I guarantee you, if somebody wants to speak to you, they'll stop and speak to you. If they don't want to speak to you, they'll drive on. Yeah, I'm going to have more walk. So I, if, if a person comes down and they're driving without the road block, if they wish to stop to speak to you, they can stop to speak to you. So we understand that it's an, it may be an inconvenience for some of these people, but we're not breaking the law in doing what we're doing. And we're okay with being an inconvenience to them, because what's happening in there is horrific and unjust. And unjust. You, as police officers, are supposed to uphold the law. You're supposed to uphold justice. And the law says that what's going on there just now is just that the law historically has not always been correct. It has not always been morally correct. What's happening just now is unjust. Same respect what happens in there and what happens elsewhere in relation to the Criminal Justice Act, Police Fault and Act, Public Law Act. That's the majority of what we deal with right on the streets. Okay? In relation to that, I realise that's a huge issue to many, many people and other many ethical conditions in the way public bars deal with the thing. Okay? I think you can appreciate there is people who are employed in there. They do the job because that's the job they do, that's the job they choose to do. But we have absolutely no animosity towards any of the workers in there. Any, none of the drivers, none of the workers will be aggressive. I understand the conditions you believe. Understand. It does happen. I am not disagreeing with you. Some of the ethical conditions that animals are kept in, it's completely unjust. It's not the conditions for the fact that you're taking away, unnecessarily taking away sentient lives, sentient beings to do them as animals. Yeah. 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 I understand that. Yeah. I do understand yeah. that. With your I mean, right if you think about it, if you were, if if you were called out... Get, sorry. No, sorry, sorry, yeah. Because if you were called out on somebody reporting uh, somebody abusing a dog, I've, 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 yeah, I've jailed people. I've taken yeah. their dogs away from them. Yes, I appreciate that. I, I just want to show you that. This and is what happens when you stop people in the middle of the road. Okay? I'm being caught for what I'm going to happen. So, let me explain. The reason we have been called out through there, we're response officers, we're not the community policing that we can normally deal with. Yeah. Okay? Would, would you be able to get the community police down here? The community policing are intending to here here within the next hour. So okay. they're dealing with another community event at the moment, okay? We have been asked to come here because the reason we have brought is for the information that we have received is that the protesters are not going to be the ones coming down here. Well, that's not true. We're not going to be the ones coming down here. We're, we're, we're going on the initial information yeah, we've got. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then this young lady and the other gentleman that's being covered for approach this is because we want to talk to trucks. Yeah. Okay? The next thing, you are on the road.
comprehension of irony when I was like 12 years old. And um, it just went totally off my head. But I remember looking at her and she was really angry at me. And I thought, why is she so angry at me? Like, what have I said? Because I didn't say those things to be offensive or to be nasty or to be judgmental or even to mock vegetarians. I said it because I thought it was true. Like, I honestly thought that you needed meat to be healthy. And if you didn't, you would be weak, weak pale and skinny. I mean, Natasha was a lot stronger than I was, let me tell you that. I and mean, I've always been fairly scrawny, especially back then. So I was kind of a living contradiction in a sense. But it, it was interesting because I reflect on that moment a lot. And even though it seems so insignificant, it kind of dawned on me recently that the reason I said those things is because that's what I've been told to say. And I kind of just lived my life believing that that was what vegetarians were. I mean, I didn't know what a vegan was 10 years ago. Most of us probably didn't. The only time that vegetarianism was brought up in my home was when we were taking the mick out of it. It was a joke. It was a laugh. You know, the idea of compassion on earth and not hurting animals was something for us to have a laugh around the dinner table. I mean, that's, that's literally sort of the family that I came from. Um, so I didn't know what veganism was and vegetarians were pale, weak and skinny. I want to go back now about five years ago, so I'm still not vegetarian, I'm definitely not vegan at this point. And um, I'm ordering pizza with a friend and my friend was veggie. And I said to him, should we get bacon on the pizza? And he was like, no. And I said, why not? I mean, why wouldn't you want to get bacon on pizza? Like bacon literally belongs on pizza. Can you even call it pizza? if there's not bacon on top of it, right? I mean, what's a pizza without bacon? That's just bread and tomato puree, surely. And my friend said, Ed, I don't think an animal should die for a pizza topping. I said, what are you talking about? These animals are bred for that purpose, right? We give pigs life, they give us bacon. That's, that's the food chain, right? That's the system. That's how these animals are raised. That's what they're bred for. That's their purpose. Why would you not want to eat bacon? I mean, bacon is life. I was one of those people, you know, those people we get angry at now. That, that was me, bacon is life. That's what I used to say. I mean, it's kind of a a cliche I suppose in so many ways but like most of us I, I loved animal products and it always strikes me as really unusual when people turn around to me and say oh you just never taste this steak I'm like no I mean I had many cow steaks before like I've eaten a lot of cow flesh in my time I did I loved it like, like most of us did it was something I enjoyed and I don't say that with kind of any sense of anything other than shame but it's the honest truth I did enjoy these products and I think that's something that most of us have to bear the responsibility of admitting um, but it always strikes me strange that these people think we've always been born vegan. Um, in fact, they kind of have this contradiction. They say, were well, you born vegan? You're like, no, and they say, ah, so, you know, you're guilty as well. <laughs> but if you say yes, like, well, you've never tasted it before, it's kind of like, you can't win, can you, in so many senses. Um, but I love the taste of these products. I get Domino's Pizza pretty much every week. I get KFC all the time. The people who work there knew me by my name, knew my favourite order was, which is a Zinger Box Meal and Extra Hot Wings. You know, it's just part of my life, like it was for so many of us. Um, but this point when my friend said no to the bacon on the pizza was a big moment for me because, I don't know, it caused me to question so much that I'd never really questioned before. And just the, the notion of not consuming animals seemed so foreign to me. I mean, why wouldn't you? I mean, it's socially acceptable. I think it's in the BBC, it's talking about how, I think it's about 1,500 of these birds died on the impact of the crash alone. 1,500 animals just dead from the impact alone. I mean, that's crazy, right? It's just insane. But what disturbed me even more than that was the fact that there were many more of these animals, hundreds more of them that were still alive, but they were mutilated. They had broken winds and broken bones. And in fact, I visited a rescue center not so long ago, just near Manchester where the crash happened and the, and the people that run the rescue center had managed to rehome 3,000 of the birds. They had like a big area of land and they managed to shepherd 3,000 of them into this field that they owned and then rehomed them over the next days, which is an amazing, amazing thing that they did. But they showed me pictures from the crash sites and when I say that their faces were hanging off, I mean that. Like, their beaks were hanging off, their combs were hanging off. You could see inside their faces of these chickens, but they were alive. And even though I didn't know the grisly detail of it when I was reading the article, I kind of got an idea of how much these animals were suffering. Um, and I recognised that these animals have the ability to feel pain. And that's such a simple recognition to have. Yeah, I'd never considered it before. I mean, why would I ever stop to think that the animals that I was eating would suffer or feel pain. I mean, I acknowledge that the dogs and cats did. If I stood in the dog's tail, I recognised that the dog felt pain and suffered as a result and would very much physically tell me that they were suffering. Yet for some reason, I'd never acknowledged that the animals that I ate, the cows, the pigs, the chickens, the sheep, the ducks, the geese, and every other animal I consumed, I never ever thought for a second that they'd suffered or that they felt pain. And I never once for a second thought that they valued their life. But reading that story and hearing about the fact that they were suffering and that they were in pain 
made me realize that they did value their life. And that if they had a choice, they'd much rather live their life than not live their life. If they had a choice, right? But as a consumer, me buying that product mean, meant that I denied them that choice. I took that choice away from them. They were never given a choice in their life. Everything that they <coughs> happened in their life was decided for them. They didn't have autonomy over their own existence. I mean, how cruel is that to think that you don't even have control over your own existence. Everything you do is determined for you. What you eat, where you live, how you live, and when you die is determined for you and decided for you before you might even have been born. I mean, that's absurd to me, but I've never considered it before. But I realized in the moment that by me consuming their flesh, I denied them their choice or preference to live. And I also realized I was a hypocrite because I ate their flesh, right? And in my fridge was chicken breasts and chicken thighs and yesterday's Zinger box meal and all sorts of different products that contained their body parts. And I was a hypocrite, right? If I felt sorry for these animals in that moment, and I felt sorry for the fact that they were suffering, when the only reason they were there in the first place was because of me, who was I to continue eating their flesh if I wanted to sympathize with them and empathize with them? So that moment questioned or made me question fundamentally so much about my life, my entire lifestyle, why I did the things that I did, why I bought the products that I bought. It made me look through what I'd been told by society and acknowledge that maybe the way I was living, or had been living for almost 20 years at that point, was immoral. Right? Such a simple moment can have such a profound effect on the way that we perceive the world and the way we perceive our own actions. Such a simple thing as just coming across a story caused me to reevaluate everything that I'd grown to know about what I ate and how I lived and my viewpoint towards animals and how they should be treated and how they should be respected. Now, I always like to think this, but it could be a bit disingenuous. <coughs> I went vegetarian after that point because I didn't really know what the fact that they're ex egg players really meant. I didn't know about the dairy industry. But I'd like to think that if I'd known everything in that moment, I'd have made more of a change in that moment of veganism. But I feel that that's probably disingenuous because, like most of us, I was in this kind of warped misperception or misconception that vegetarianism was enough, right? Like most of us, I thought that if you didn't eat meat, you were somehow combating the problem of animal exploitation and that. You know, if you didn't milk cows, they'd explode, and if you didn't take the eggs from hens, they would, well, who knows what you think hens would do, but, but something terrible would happen. So I was stuck in that paradigm that so many of us have been stuck in, which says that if you're vegetarian, you're not contributing to animal suffering. And my partner, she kept saying to me, this was about eight months later or six months later, she kept saying to me, we should watch this documentary called Earthlings. She'd seen it advertised or posted on someone's Instagram. And I thought to myself, like, no, come on. I know what this film's about. It's about animal cruelty. This is, it's, it's about extreme cases. It's about, it's about bad farms and bad farmers and bad practices. Why am I going to put myself through that? Why am I going to watch 90 minutes of animal abuse? I'm vegetarian. Animals don't die for me. I'm, I'm doing my bit for the animals. She kept pressing me. She kept pressing me. You know. It's starting to get a bit not. <laughs> right. Watch earthlings. Watch earthlings. I'm like, no, please leave me alone. I want to eat halloumi, right? That was, that was me. Selfish, you know? That's fundamentally what I was. Anyway, one day she... We were in bed and the laptop came out and she's like, well, watch Nerflings, you know, you can either get out of bed or watch it. <laughs> and I, I'm like, I'm pretty lazy and mornings are really hard for me, so it was like, stay in bed or get out of bed. So I was like, fine, you know what, you win, I'll stay and I'll watch it. Um, needless to say, 90 minutes later, I felt different, you know, something changed inside of me and I was crying. I, I mean, I cried a little bit throughout the film, but it's after the, finish, the film finished that it sinks in. When you're watching something like that, so often you can't really process what it is you're seeing, but afterwards you process it all at once, and it's like, oh, shit, this is terrible. Like, this is, the magnitude of this is, is massive, right? And I realized that it's not just about me, it's about dairy and eggs and tasting and entertainment and clothing and, and everything, because what we don't realize is nearly every aspect of our lives, nearly every aspect of our lives involves some level of animal exploitation and we don't even perceive the magnitude of how much we exploit animals the numbers in the ways for the products is absurd and I realized in that 90 minutes just how much we do and how much we use them and how much we take their lives for granted as if they're nothing other than an inanimate object you know they're a, a commodity a property even pets 
who I thought, as a society, we cherished animals, companion animals. I thought we loved them, but then I saw the footage of the way we treated them, and we dumped them in shelters and in pounds and bought them from pets at home or wherever it is, and we valued them as objects as well. And I thought, this is serious. This is much bigger than I'd ever first imagined. This is so much bigger than just food, or even just meat. So it encouraged me to, to go vegan. And then I watched Conspiracy, and it's just like, oh my goodness, right? what now? What else can there possibly be? What else am I going to learn in this journey? And then I watched Fox Over Knives, and I'm like, oh my goodness, like, this is not just about animals anymore, right? And it's true, but veganism, all of a sudden, veganism isn't just about animals. People sometimes say to me, there's bigger issues in the world. Someone said this to me earlier. And I said, from your point of view, it might seem that way now. But when you look into what veganism is, or what our exploitation of animals causes, you'll see that there is no bigger issue that we are currently facing. Because our exploitation of animals affects everything. Every single life form. Our planet, nature, the animal kingdom. Everything is affected and will be destroyed if we continue what we're doing now. Whoa, right? 21 years of my life living a certain way, you get hit with all this information, it's like, what do you do? I mean, how do you process that? What, what do I do now? And, and you have this idea when you go vegan that you, you'll tell someone and they'll just turn around and say, you've convinced me I'm vegan, I'm doing do on the spot. And I get a reply like, you're going to die from synthetic proteins and by the way, use a mobile phone. And it's like, oh my goodness, like, what? And you just think that when you tell them, they're going to read it and be as shocked as you are. And that they're just going to change on the spot and you'll all have a big happy vegan roast. And just for me it didn't happen. And then you feel full of despair because you know the suffering, you know the magnitude of it, but people aren't listening to you. And it's almost as if people don't care. Why don't people care? You know, why would people not care about life itself? Their own life, their health their future, the future of their children, their grandchildren, the planet itself. Why is it that people are so apathetic to existence? Why is it? Why has that happened? And the more I sat with this feeling of why, the more I became uncomfortable that I was being silent. And I tried to talk to my parents and it was disastrous, <laughs> to say the least. Sent an email to my dad as well, never heard about it, never heard back from him, didn't reply to me. Next time I talk to him, he's like, oh, did you see this film at cinema? I'm like, yeah, did, did you get my email? <laughs> right. let's, just, let's just pretend these things aren't happening. Like, people barely question myself. And if we throw information at people, it's really difficult for people to process that information. Because if you say the future of the world is at stake, people can't even grasp what that looks like. Because it's such a fundamentally monumental thing, right? So... It becomes too hard to process, and you just push people away when you throw information at them. And I realized that actually what we have to do is just make people question themselves, right? And we don't have to throw everything at them and get them to understand everything in one go. We just have to put that thought in their mind, that thought that being put in my mind from the chicken truck crash, right? That simple kind of processing of, whoa, is this moral? Can I justify this? How am I going to continue purchasing these products? That kind of thought process that most of us had on our journey to veganism. And that feeling that silence was complicity kept, kept annoying me. And one of my kind of like final pushes to become an activist was I was at uni. And I'd always been quite quiet when I was at uni because I didn't want to be labelled as preachy or extremist or I was so scared of people pointing to me and saying, you're an annoying vegan. I didn't want that. I just wanted to be Ed. I wanted to be the same Ed that people knew from uni but I just didn't eat animal products anymore. And that was fine, no one really minded, and everything was perfect and brilliant. Yeah, but that didn't, that didn't help, right? And that didn't work out so well. And after I'd seen Cowspiracy, I told this, this girl, Rihanna, she wasn't really a friend of mine, but I knew her quite well. I was like, oh, Rihanna, I saw this, um, this documentary about animal agriculture, now it's destroying the rainforests. And she turned around to me and said, yeah, but you know, soy farming is destroying the Amazon. And I didn't know what to say to her. I'd never heard this before. I'd never been told about soy farm, and I didn't know what environmental destruction it was causing. I didn't know what to say. And because I didn't know what to say, I didn't have anything to say. And I remember she looked at me. She had this real smug look in her face. And I, and I tell you, it got right under my skin because I knew in that moment that I'd kind of eased her conscience and that she was going to go and buy animals now in the future and like think, well, Ed's destroying the Amazon with his tofu, so I'm going to eat some beef. Right? That was the thought process that was in her mind, and it really annoyed me. And I said to myself, never again. 
Am I going to see that smug look on someone's face? I know, I'm never again am I going to go home and think that I've allowed someone to continue eating animals with an eased conscience, right? That was fundamentally what it was. I was upset with myself that this person felt that they'd somehow justified killing animals. That really upset me. And I thought, well, how am I going to get around this? Because I know people are going to ask me questions, they're going to give me excuses. Um, what am I going to do to combat that? I realised I had to educate myself as much as possible, and I had to know a response to everything, or as much as I possibly could, so that in future, if that happened again, I'd be more equipped, or better equipped, is the, the correct phrasing. And, you know, in future, or now, if she came up to me and said that, I'd be like, well, that's a great point, I mean, soy farming is destroying the environment, but let's just bear this in mind. 85% of the soil that we grow has been fed to livestock animals, so actually it's your consumption of animal products that's destroying the Amazon because of soy production. So if you're worried about soy farming, then you kind of shot yourself in the foot there because it's yourself, right? And I didn't know how to say that. Now I do, because I went home and I researched it, and I did that with as much as I possibly could. I read some books, um, I watched some documentaries, I watched lots of YouTube videos, and I really got into YouTube. Um, I thought it was a fantastic platform, what a great platform, these little eight minute videos, you could learn so much of them, they're so shareable, people are really charismatic, I learned something, I thought this is brilliant, YouTube is such a fantastic platform for, for activism, for vegan education, it makes so much sense, and the more I watched it, the more I felt, well, maybe I should do something like this, <laughs> and again, it's my partner, she, she did all of this, she said to me, you should set up a YouTube channel, and at first I was like, no, come on, really, like, no, I don't want to do that. And she's like, no, you, you, should, you should do it. I've got a camera, we've got a microphone, sit down, we're going to shoot a video. And I thought, all right. So I remember we shot this first video and I'm like, hi, my name's Ed and welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm going to talk to you about veganism. And it was horrible, right? It was just dreadful. And I'm like, my arms are all over and I'm, <laughs> my body language is terrible. And I'm like, oh no. And I was like, there's no way I'm uploading this, not a chance. And she's like, all right, we'll, we'll shoot it again. So we shot it again. And I was like, you know what? Let's just go for it. What, I mean, what's the worst that can happen, right? I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I self, self-deprecate myself off and I can laugh at myself. Let's try it. Let's just see what happens. You know, and it was a slow process and I put more and more videos out and I started to feel really confident doing it. I felt good about it. I realized that I was articulating myself in a way that I was actually educating myself. I realized that through researching these videos, I was actually teaching myself so much. And I was actually learning from doing it myself. Um, and I wanted to do something that I'd not, seen on YouTube before. So back in April 2016 I did this series called 30 Days Fake Excuses which is basically the thought process behind it was I was going to upload a video every day to debunk a non-vegan argument. I recently did it at the beginning of this year. Um, and that was a really great thing for me because as I was doing that I researched it. And by the end of those 30 days I felt like oh, I've got so much knowledge now about how to debunk arguments. I felt really confident about it. And so the natural thing from then was to go out and, and become a street activist and, and go and do some street activism. And again, I was really nervous about this. Like, it's natural to be nervous about these things. Like, you're doing something that's very unusual. Going out and speaking to strangers about something that you feel so passionate about is not what most people in society do. And it is nerve-wracking. Like, don't get me wrong, it is. And I put it off for a long time. And I, I was actually in New York when I did my first outreach event. It was an Earthlings experience. And um, I was with my partner again, we're in the Museum of Modern Art, and, and we found out there was an Earthlings experience on in Times Square. You know, I, you know, I quite like art, and I was wondering, I was like, you know, I quite like this, but I feel like I'm doing an injustice knowing there's something going on around the corner that I could go to where I'm here, I'm here like, pretending to soak in some art, you know, and really all I'm doing is staring and pretending I understand the meaning when I'm <laughs> just nothing for me. So we're like, okay, let's go. Let's go to Times Square and let's join in. And I absolutely loved it. I thought it was brilliant. I thought, wow, this is, this is making such a difference. I'm having conversations with people and they're reacting and responding to what I'm saying and, and I'm enjoying it. And I had this conversation with this guy dressed as, as Batman. And I remember him so well. He was, he was, he was an intense man. I don't know if you've seen it, but um, he, was, he, was an he was a great character. And I came out of it and I felt so thrilled. I had this kind of like, it, was almost, it wasn't shouting, but it was, quite, it was quite larry, you know? And I thought, oh, this is great. And afterwards he shook my hand and was like, you know, you made some really valid points, and I felt really empowered by it. And I left feeling that event feeling inspired, knowing that I maybe made a difference in someone's life. And that's what's really great about activism events, especially something like the Earthlings Experience, and especially something like Anonymous for the Voiceless, um, which, you know, for those of you who are there today, what a great event it was, right? What a beautiful event it was. 
and we made such a difference. I, mean, I don't know what the tally was. 140. 140. So that's 100. So after today's activism, that's 140 people that have gone away taking veganism seriously, understanding <coughs> veganism in a different light, going home to potentially research it, and who knows, becoming vegan themselves in the future. Wow, isn't that, that's an empowering thing to know that our group of individuals, because we are all individuals, coming together as a community can make such a difference. And that's how I left feeling on my first outreach event, and it inspired me to want to do more. And I became totally addicted to it. And I started doing more and more and more and more, and I started doing more interviews on my YouTube channel. And I just fell in love with talking to people. What I absolutely love about talking to people is that everyone is so unique and you meet so many wonderful characters for these interactions, people from different countries, from different cultures, with different points of view, and you get to meet them and talk to them, and it's, it's, it's kind of a beautiful thing, because I, where else in our life do we get to have conversations with complete strangers? And people have all these little idi idiosyncratic behaviours, and it's just it's a wonderful thing. Weatherspoons, Wagamamas, GBK, these high street restaurants, these high street chains have vegan options and vegan menus and the only reason that exists is because we're demanding it, right? It's because we're asking for it, we're buying it. If people weren't buying them, they wouldn't be supplying them. Now people say to me, do you think the world is changing? It's changing in front of us and if you want to see that change, look at the options that are becoming more and more available. I've been vegan now for about three years. Go back for years and tell me there's going to be vegan cheese and Sainsbury's and Tesco's and I'll tell you you're on a different planet. Because the, the thought of it back then would have just never occurred to me. If you go back for years and tell me I can get chocolate fudge brownie Ben and Jerry's, <laughs> I'd have thought that you, you'd lost your mind and gone to a different dimension because the point is, it was such a different world back then. But now things are changing. And you can see that by what's being sold in supermarkets. So don't ever doubt the power we have as individuals when we buy products, first and foremost. Now, that's such a beautiful thing, but there's so much more we can do, right? There's so much more we can do. Now, let's take it to the next level. Not only we buy a drop of water in a pond, okay? Now, you put a drop of water in a pond, what happens is that drop starts to ripple out and out and out, and all of a sudden that one drop, seeming so insignificant, it's had such an effect on the appearance of the pond, and that ripple effect has just kept reverberating further and further and further out, right? So it dissipates. Now, every vegan is, is a drop of water in a pond, and every time we go into the pond, when we become vegan, and we start to have conversations, what we do is we enlarge <coughs> that ripple effect. Now, we talk to our friends, we talk to our family, we influence people in our immediate circle, the ripple effect grows larger, and before we know it, the ripple has grown so big. And one person has made such a significant difference. Something people always tell me is that one person can't make a difference. There's such a defeatist attitude. It's an attitude that people like to use or people like to say to try and justify themselves not changing. Someone goes, I'm only one person. I'm not going to change the world. What they're fundamentally saying is I don't want to change. And I'm going to blame the masses and their apathy for why I can't change when, in fact, it's their own apathy that's stopping them from changing. It's so convenient for us to point and say, look, this is the problem, but the reality is we are the individuals. And every community, in fact, our whole species, is formed of individuals. And all we can do is make the choice as an individual to change. That's, that's the only thing we can do, is take responsibility for our own actions, take responsibility for our own lives, and then lead by example and help others do the same. But we have to empower ourselves to make that change as an individual. So don't ever be told that one person can't make a difference, because I promise you, every person is a drop of water in a pond, and the effect that they can have is endless. It's as simple as sharing stuff online. I mean, the thing about Facebook is you share a video, you don't even need like a platform, you don't need to have a big reach. All you need to do is have people on your page, your immediate friends and family, and that has a huge effect as well. You share something, and before long that video you shared could have who knows how many thousands of views, millions of views, you just don't know. That's the beautiful thing about social media is the reach is endless and the possibilities are endless. So let's share on social media, let's share stuff out there and, and, and put it out there. And don't be disheartened if you get arguments back at you because people are acknowledging what it is that you're sharing and what it is that you're showing. And if people aren't reacting and you're not getting any likes or comments, that's all right because people are still seeing it. And what I often find is it's the people that aren't reacting or at least aren't consciously kind of debating you. They're the ones that are thinking the most. You never know when you're going to get a message from someone. So when you went to school with someone in your family, your friend, whoever it is, saying, look, I've been seeing the stuff you've been posting, and it's had an effect on me. It happens all the time, so social media. But I think we have to look bigger than that. I think we have to look bigger than all of this. And we have to start to accept 
the responsibility that is, is, is larger than just the sharing and just as talking to our immediate friends and family because I think we do have a bigger responsibility. I think if we went back 40 years, maybe we could justify it by doing those things if we had internet 40 years ago. But the fact is, we don't have time anymore. We, we, we simply don't. We don't have the luxury of time anymore. The animals have never had the luxury of time. Let's make that clear. They've never had the luxury of time. But selfishly, we don't have the luxury of time anymore. And things have to change quickly now to see any real change. We have to act now. That's the bottom line. If we don't, then we'll be the ones to reap the consequences. Antibiotic resistance. That, that, that phrasing terrifies me so much. I mean, antibiotic resistance is going to be such a big thing that we will face. And the problem is it's going to be non-discriminatory. That means that us vegans as well will be the ones that have to face a post-antibiotic era. We will be the ones that will also not have antibiotics to protect ourselves from operations and dental surgery, and <coughs> bacterial infections, and all these things we just take for granted as being able to be solved now. In the future, we may not have that luxury. And look, there's a, there's a whole host of reasons. Fundamentally, it comes down to animal exploitation. I mean, 80% of antibiotics in the US are given to livestock animals. It's 60% in this country. The reason we are entering this era of post-antibiotics is because of animal exploitation, right? But that will affect us. So that's what we have to speak up now. Our environment alone hasn't got much longer left. Our rainforests are being destroyed. Our oceans are being depleted. Our air is becoming polluted. Our planet is being destroyed in front of our very eyes. Animal agriculture, yes, there's other factors involved. We need to look at plastic consumption. We need to look at a whole host of things. But animal agriculture is so fundamental to every aspect of destruction that's happening to our planet. We don't have time anymore. We have to face that responsibility, that burden, and that burden does lie on our shoulders. That's why we have to get out and speak to people and take that information to people, people that might not want to hear it from them. But moreover, we've denied them their voice, right? They scream, but we don't hear it. They thrash and they beg, but we don't hear it. We have to be the mouth for these animals and say what they want us to say. Now, we will never be able to properly, properly advocate for them. We will never be able to do them justice in the way that they deserve. That's the constrictions of our society. And that's heartbreaking. It is. It's heartbreaking. But we have to do everything we can and do everything that is within our means. And I'm not saying you have to do what I do or what other activists do. You have to do something. Join your local activism communities. Join the SAVE movement. Bear witness. Fuel that fire inside of you by seeing animals being taken to the slaughterhouse. Film their suffering in the trucks and upload it so that your friends and family can see you in that moment. The same movement is a powerful organisation because it shows that you are there fighting. Now when we share stuff it can be easy for our friends and family to distance themselves from what it is that we're sharing. But when they see that it's you there, it's you showing that footage, it's you narrating that footage, it's you by that truck in that slaughterhouse in the village where you grew up, or in the village where you live now, that's so powerful. That's so powerful, it makes it seem real. And it shows people these animals are individuals. So join your local save movement if you can, if you have one near you, and you feel that that's what you want to do. Join your local anonymous for the voiceless. Join the cube, hold the laptop, share the footage, show it to people, make people confront what they don't want to see, what those industries don't want you to see. Speak to people, join the outreach team, communicate what's happening on the screen, tell people why you're there, explain passionately about why they should be there with you, about why they should be vegan, about why you care about being vegan. Shadow someone. The beautiful thing about Anonymous the Voiceless is you don't have to go in with all the confidence. You can be nervous, you could be inexperienced. Go and listen to people, see how it operates, listen to the, co the communication, the interactions. See how these events unfold and build your confidence over time. Activism is a journey. And I look back at the person I was two years ago when I went to New York for their first Earthlings experience. And if you told me I'd be doing the things I'm doing now, I'd have told you you're talking to the wrong person. You do it, you feel better for it. You feel more confident. You learn something new. You pick up something new. You hear a different phrase that you can incorporate into your own activism. It's all a journey. And we're in this journey together. We're in this community together those who come together today to profess that we cared about them to do when we left today. We expect them to do something to help us. 
to fight for us, to stand up for us, to speak up for us, to advocate for us, to do everything that they could do to make sure that in the future, <coughs> suffering ended. Now, we won't save those animals that are alive today. We won't. Those piglets will be mutilated, those cows will be taken from their mothers, those chickens will die on the shed floors, these things will happen. We cannot stop that. But what we can stop is animals being put in those situations in the future. What we can stop is animals suffering like that in the future. That is why we're vegan. That is why we're activists, to end the suffering, to make sure these animals are never bred into these situations and into these environments again. We owe it to the animals that died for us before to make sure that we fight today. Because I wasn't born vegan, like I said, and for most of us, we weren't. And what that means is that we have to accept the responsibility that animals died for us, right? We have to accept that. Yes, it hurts. It doesn't hurt as much as the animals suffered when they were killed for us, but it hurts us because we feel guilty, because we know better now. And yes, maybe we weren't conscious at the time and we were unconsciously <coughs> consuming, but that doesn't change anything. We were still morally culpable in a sense. So we have to do what we can now to make sure that we pay our debt for the animals that died for us before. It's not always easy. It's not going to be. But it's about perspective. It's about keeping the perspective in mind. And yes, it may put us out of our comfort zone. Yes, it may hurt. Yes, it may make us feel uncomfortable. Yes, it may put us in situations that are awkward and that we don't want to be in. But our suffering will never be the same. And our inconvenience will never be the same. We have to keep perspective. And when you do that, it fuels you to do more. To do more than you may believe in yourself do more than maybe you can believe you can do now. But every single one of us can do some amazing things. I truly, from the bottom of my heart, believe that. But more importantly, we have that responsibility to do better things. Now, I speak a lot about we have to do this and it's important that we do that or we're morally obliged to do that. And that's all kind of well and good and fair enough. You may say, yes, and I get that, but you're not really giving me help, right? You're telling me I've got to do this, but you're not really telling me how I should do it. You kind of throw this kind of thing at me, making me feel guilty, telling me there's animals suffering. And yes, I feel terrible for that. You've proved your point, but what am I going to do with that information? Because I'm just going to run out now and scream animal abuse at people. That's not going to help. Like, I want to be active, but I also want to do it well. And I want to be effective. I want to advocate strongly, and I don't want to do any injustice to the animals. Because I made a mistake when I first went vegan. And that mistake was to get angry. Most of us have felt that anger. We should feel that anger. It's important that we feel that anger. Let's just talk about that. Let's, let's, let's address this. What do you feel? Think about what's happening. Right? Think about what you've seen on the footage. Think about what you've borne witness to at vigils. Think about why you're vegan. And what do you feel? Anger and frustration and despair and frustration and just hopelessness. Right? Those feelings. Yeah, you're feeling that with me? I'm feeling that. There's a reason why we feel that. There's a reason why that exists within, within all of us. And it wouldn't exist within all of us if we didn't care. But it exists there because we do care, right? And because we, we're passionate about why we're vegan and we feel that it's an important thing to do. Let's just consider very blanket right now that currently, globally, we slaughter, I think, well, I always thought it's 56 billion land animals. But apparently it could be more. It could be closer to 72 to 76 billion land animals every single year. That's a huge number, right? And what disturbs me about that number is that's just the number of animals that are, are kind of registered as being killed. What that doesn't account for is all the animals that are culled on farms, all the animals that die on the way to the slaughterhouse, right? Let me, let me put this into some perspective for you. I visited a, a broil farm, a chicken broil farm, so a, a meat chicken farm. Um, this is one of the first times I ever visited one. Big farm, 17 sheds. In each shed, there's between 35 to 40,000 birds, right? Um, so you think about that, 16. 16, 16 sheds, 40,000 birds in each shed. There's a little quarantine zone before you go into the main, into the main barn, right? And in the quarantine zone, that's where you put your wellies on, you kind of put your, you know, your decontamination clothing on, you don't bring diseases and bacteria from the outside world into the shed and, and vice versa. Now, in this kind of quarantine zone, there's a wall chart. And on the wall chart, they log how many animals there are in the barn, but they also log how many they cull, right? Cull, <coughs> meaning killed. Now, in this one barn that I went into, they culled, or the farmer culled, on average, 100 birds a day in that one barn. One barn. 16 barns on that farm, that's an average of 1,600 birds a day that that farmer culled on one farm. 
right? So when I say that the figure is 72 billion land animals, whatever it is, that's not accounting for all the animals that are culled, for all the male calves that are often shot. They're not registered. They're not licensed. The people come and shoot them. They get ground up, fed to the hounds for hunting or whatever it is. The chickens, the piglets, the animals that die of diseases. The figure that I tell you when I say 72 billion or whatever it is, is the figure of the animals that get to the slaughterhouse and are killed in a slaughterhouse. It ignores all the lives that are lost during that process. Binge on life, purge negativity and starve guilty feelings. Speak to you all soon and love you.